Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bernier. On this episode, I'm very excited to be talking with Richard Fisher. Richard is an award-winning senior journalist at the BBC over in London. Uh, he's done many uh, jobs over there as a managing editor for BBC.com, which also includes BBC Future, BBC Culture, BBC Homepage, and BBC Real. He was also selected for the 2019-2020 Knight Science Journalism Fellowship at MIT over here in the States, where he really got to uh, expound upon his ideas of long-termism, which is what his uh, first book is about. Uh, that book is called The Long View, Why We Need to Transform How the World Sees Time. And that is what we talk about in this conversation. We start by talking about how are we uh, short-term in our thinking in our society and how we got here, right? Uh, why are we planning for more long-term investments for our future as our, in our society? You know, why aren't we planning for, you know, up to year 2100, 2200? Um, he talks about some of the historical aspects of long-termism, um, how we can have a positive outlook for different futures, not just a dystopian, post-apocalyptic kind of uh, uh, future. We talk about long-termism and capitalism. And with capitalism, he, he explains that um, there, are, there it's not a, a, a kind of attribution of whether capitalism is good or bad, but more of why are we only thinking fiscal year to fiscal year or quarter to quarter? How do we kind of reach further into deep time to think more of how to plan for our future? Uh, we also talk about long-termism in our politics. And again, we just kind of go election to election. We can't, we can't get past every two or four or whatever years. I mean, why, why that's, you know, really hurting us in the long run. We talk about some of the evolutionary work that's been done on foresight and long-termism. We talk about how we can think about deep time, past and present. We talk about climate change and some of the practical implications of, of long-termism. You know, I, as I, I've said in other places, um, we, we, we need to, we need to think about our future. How do we, how do we go forward? We spend so much time thinking about, you know, uh, what we did in the 20th century, which was great. And, and a lot of that gets us to where we're at now, but we have to, we have to think forward. We have to think about how are we getting into the next 50 years, a hundred years, 200, 500 years, um, big innovators, big visionaries. Um, and they need to be rooted in practical, uh, applied ways of getting there, not just idealism, not just, you know, you know, fantasy, but how is it rooted? You know, some things take a while and we need to sometimes do things very slowly. Sometimes we can do them quickly, but we need, we need, yes, politicians, but I think we need, uh, thinkers. I think we need a lot of different people, you know, and, and inventors, innovators, um, many, many different folks, young folks really pushing for what's 2050 look like what's 2100 look like you know and 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 you know enough with the kind of navel gazing or the resistance or the anti whatever to what's been going on the past five years or 10 years it's more of how do we keep pushing forward and um i think that that's really important and i i think i think richard's work is really important and something we need to take seriously and, and all think about you know how we're contributing in our to society in our own way for the future and how we're very forward pushing in that way. Uh, as always, you can find this conversation and all past and upcoming conversations at my free Substack, uh, Converging Dialogues at Substack.com. I'm also on YouTube. You can follow me there as well. Uh, so follow me in all the places. Um, support Richard, get his book, and uh, I bring you Richard Fisher. I'm here with Richard Fisher. Uh, Richard, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I'm uh, looking forward to talking to you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to be talking. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, your your uh, topic of your book that you have uh, coming out is, uh, as we were saying before we get on here, is having quite the moment, long-termism, which is super fascinating. Uh, before we get into the book, why don't you tell listeners um, you know, who you are, what your background's in, what you currently research and think about, and uh, and yeah, all the particulars. Sure. So, um, so I'm, I'm Richard. I'm a, I'm a writer and I'm a, a science journalist. Uh, I've been for most of my career focused on uh, science and uh, working at places like New Scientist. And I, at the moment, I work at the BBC uh, for a section called BBC Future, 
which uh, despite the name covers lots of things, in, including history, well, which is a bit counterintuitive. Uh, but we, you know, we 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 cover kind of in-depth stories about science, technology, and health. And um, a few years ago, I uh, took a sabbatical from the BBC and spent some time at MIT. Uh, stood back from the the day to day life of a journalist and took lots of classes at MIT and Harvard. It was it was the best year of my life, to be honest. Uh, oh. it, it was wonderful. The family came out with me, and I, during that time, um, I kind of dove into the topic of uh, long term thinking. Hmm. It was a it was a kind of subject that had always been there. Um, you know, I, I could trace back to when I did geology back at university you know, 20 years ago. Uh, but uh, this was an opportunity for me to kind of really dive into to one single topic. And so for the past few years, ever since then, I've been thinking and writing about what it is to take a long term view. You know, what, what are the causes of short termism within society? And then how, how do we kind of embrace uh, that, that kind of deeper perspective of time? Yeah. Well, I think it's I think it's super important and it's not talked about enough. <clears throat> One of the things that uh I kind of get frustrated about with um many different types of folks, uh politicians or or other, you know, thinkers is that everything feels very short term. Like what's happening in the next year and what's happening in the next 5 years and you know, sometimes people may think 20 or so years, but really that's it. And people you know, even when even when when people talk about uh, the effects of climate change and things like that, and it's kind of these big, 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 big scale kinds of things, it's never really mentioned. You know, a hundred years from now or two hundred years from now, um, and and so you talk about that in the in the book and all these things, which we'll get into. So I'll be really interested to hear um, your your kind of uh, ideas about this, and then all of the different aspects um, and domains that it kind of impacts. Of course, many people may think about climate change, but that's just one example. There's many, many, many aspects such as you know, the role of technology or, you know, AI or our, our human uh, connections and relationships so on, so on and so forth. The book is called the long view, why we need to transform how the world sees time. Now, if I remember correctly, um, this is out this month here in March out in the UK, but I think it's a little bit longer over here in the States. Is it, is it September in the States? Is that right? Uh, there isn't a confirmed date yet, but it's oh. co it's hopefully coming, you know, it's uh, that down the line, I guess. Uh, yeah. I, 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 my, my publisher is still looking at that, you know, so I think, okay. yeah, my, my publisher likes to joke every time I ask these questions, like you've got to take the long view, you know, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, that's uh, good. That's very good. Yeah. It's very good. Um, well, it, it will be available in the UK. So all the UK listeners, anywhere else uh, that it's available or just UK? Uh, Australia and then various other different territories. Yeah. And, okay. You know, okay. You can, you can, yeah, you can order the book and, and shift, uh, you know, ship it across the, the Atlantic if you really want. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know. it, it, did you do the audio book as well? I did. Yeah. That was, a, that was an experience. That's uh, I've never done that before. Like at that length, I've done voiceovers for BBC films and that kind of thing. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, that's like, you know, 15 hours, 15, yeah. 20 hours in the booth. And, you know, yeah. you suddenly, yeah, you realize that you, uh, there's certain words that you can't read. Like, you know, the certain, <laughs> like the, the, the word trajectory is throughout the book. And mm -hmm. it's very hard to say trajectory sometimes when you're under pressure. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, le legislative as well. I can say it now, but like when I was yeah. trying to record it, I uh, couldn't say it down. When I've, when I've known people that have uh, read their own books for the audiobook, they'll say, ah, that's where you realize wow, I didn't need to say all this, or why didn't yeah, I yeah. keep this shorter? Or why did I use those words? Or why didn't yeah, I yeah. say that, you know, it's a, it's a very, it's an interesting, uh, I think, kind of exercise. So uh, yeah, well, that's in, good though. In, that's in good. one of the chapters, there's a whole, there's a, cause I write, I write about Japan at various points mm -hmm. in the book. And then, but then there's, there's, the, there's this chapter where the, every other sentence is a Japanese God, uh, you know, <laughs> so we had to look up every single uh, pronunciation to get it right. <laughs> No, so it was yeah. fun. I loved it though. It was a fun experience to. That's yeah, great. Know, really, really it, like but is is the is the audio book available for everybody? I guess or no? Is that still yeah? Yeah, it should be. Yeah, I mean, so no, it'll be on Audible. Yeah. So. Oh, okay. 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 Mm -hmm. Cool. Cool. Very cool. Okay. So okay. So let's let's start with I guess the main uh, kind of thesis here. So you, I think, in the beginning of the book, you talk about how we're pretty short termed. Uh, in our outlook as a society, a global society, and maybe different regions, um, what is a kind of short-term outlook? Maybe that sounds kind of like a very obvious question, but how do you usually kind of find the limits and boundaries of that? And why do you push for 
this uh, long-term uh, kind of view of, of understanding uh, our place in society? Well, I suppose I can start with, I mean, you mentioned earlier on that, that uh, you look around the, the, what, the society that we live in or societies that we live in, and, you know, you can, you can start to see short-term thinking everywhere in, mm -hmm. in business, in politics, on, on the issue of climate change. And it, it's, that, that for me was where it started, you know, seeing the problem. I, um, I, I, I was thinking about my, my daughter's kind of like uh, path and life ahead of her, you know, and, and so that's how the book starts, you know, reflecting on the fact that my daughter, born in 2013, uh, stands a pretty good chance of seeing the next century. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that, I had a daydream, you know, after she was born, just think, thinking about that, you know, what, what, when the fireworks go off uh, in the year, you know, 2099, uh, what, what will that kind of actually look like from her perspective? Um, but then, you know, then I remembered there are all sorts of kind of headlines uh, and stories that I encounter as a journalist all the time that have the the kind of the year 2100 or the 22nd century in them. And they're rarely rosy. You know, it's, it's usually about kind of sea levels will get to rise by this 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 date to a certain level. You know, the world will be on fire. The job jobs will be taken by robots. And, you know, I, so that that was got me thinking about, like, kind of why do we not kind of like think with this uh, a longer view on all these issues what, what are the causes and you know what how did we get to this point and so w when I was out in Cambridge you know at MIT I, I spent a year thinking about this question like you know what what are the uh, reasons that we uh, entered this, this 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 period where it's so hard to think beyond the present how, how did the now become so loud and salient in in our day-to-day -day lives um, and so, you know, that, that, that led me down various different paths. I tried to kind of piece together some of the history, you know, so I, I asking the question, like, well, well, how did people in the past think about, you know, past, present and future? Did they have a longer view than us? Like, what, what are the kind of like cultural uh, pressures and stresses that lead to uh, a kind of short term view? And then also what are the psychological habits? And so that for the first half of the book, that's that's what I kind of explore. Like, that was kind of my attempt to to look at the reasons and to understand that better and that, you know that kind of led me to the conclusion that you know we we all have a a time view uh, a kind of temporal perspective on the world that's shaped by our culture knowledge and assumptions and so that the, there are people who lived in the past that lived you know in a time that was very different to ours and thought very differently about time itself mm -hmm. um so you know the, the all these kind of external pressures which I call temporal stresses are kind of shaping our, our kind of worldview. Um, but then there's also internal ones as well, like uh, with temporal habits, like psych psychological biases, which uh, exist, you know, the most famous being the kind of the marshmallow effect where, you know, people are more likely to kind of uh, choose a marshmallow in front of them uh, rather than wait for two later on. You know, it applies to adults just as much as it does children. But, you know, there's a whole host of, uh, psychological kind of habits that we can get into if you want to talk about those like that they kind of again shape our a kind of like short-term view um the 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 long view though is 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 not impossible to to embrace but i think that's one, one of the things i uh discovered over the past few years is that there are all sorts of people working in all sorts of realms of life of, of work you know all, all converging on the idea that the long term matters, but they're starting from very different starting points. There's, you know, there's philosophers, there's people in technology, there's people who work in the, the arts and creative sector. You know, there, there are scientists that they're, they're kind of at, at the moment they're uh, kind of separate and they tend not to talk to each other so much. But that that was what was so interesting to me as a journalist that I, I saw an opportunity to draw the links between various different kind of groups and organizations, individuals, and, and kind of bring them all together in a, in a book. And so, yeah, that's been my project over the past few years. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, as you said, you you start the beginning of the book by kind of going backwards first. <clears throat> so you go 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 through his, history, various points in history, and, and say, well, how do they think about this? Or what was their kind of, you know, lens they were looking at this? Um, I think there was some some part where in, in the book, I think the first or second chapter where you talk about, there was this kind of... Um, looking to the stars and looking to the heavens and looking about the afterlife and people still do that today um you know without getting without going through a minefield i mean obviously there's you know certain religions can offer some type of certainty of sorts of well here's where you're going to go when you die or 
you know, this life is not the only thing you have. You have something after this or um, now that may be may one view of it, but, you know, just in, you know, I guess in the, you know, um, you know, first and second century, all the way up to, you know, the, you know that first millennium to the second millennium, how, how do we kind of, how do people in the past kind of think about long-term futures? Obviously people didn't live as long. Um, people's life expectancy was, was shorter for, you know, disease and illness and many other things, but yeah, what was the kind of outlook, you know, throughout various points in history before of what the future would look like and and how they would prepare for it or how much they cared about it or not or things like that? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a, it's a tricky question because you know it's it's hard to ask people. Yeah, obviously, like you know, what, what, but you you know you can piece together clues from uh, the writing and the things that people built. I mean, I, I, it it wasn't the case that people living thousands of years ago had no sense of the future. Right. And that so if you look at things like Stonehenge over where I live in England or the Great Wall of China, you know, there were clearly people who were capable of planning ahead mm -hmm. and and you know th thinking about kind of the 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 afterlife and 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 what the future might hold for themselves. But um when you when you kind of like think about what our kind of perspective perspective of time looks like, uh, you know, living in the West in the 21st century. It is going to be very different. I mean, there was no sense that the universe was, you know, came from a big bang 13 billion years ago, mm -hmm. um, nor there was that much of a sense that of, of kind of billion year futures ahead, you know, with the, the, with the sun potentially dying, you know, in a billion years time. So um, the, 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 there were kind of long views of, of a different type, though, in the past. And, you know, I, I think um, while um, there was an element of, of cycles, you know, especially in, in the Middle Ages, you know, things things were kind of framed by seasons and rulers rising and falling, kingdoms, very old Game of Thrones kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, there, there, there were kind of examples like cathedral thinking, where you know people built cathedrals that would last beyond their their lifetime. Uh, well, sorry, they, they started building cathedrals knowing that the next generation would finish them. Um, and I, I, then found, there, there, uh, I, I found I found sorry I found that chapter really fascinating because I've never thought about it in the way that you talked about it. We always think about like the the grandeur and 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 how beautiful it is and wow like you know, who, you know humans built that etc. But that idea that this took 150 years to build or whatever it is, like how does someone like how do you get a group of people together? however many people and be like, look, we're going to start something and we're not going to finish it. We're all going to die. And like, it's not going to be even our kids that finish it. It's probably our grandkids or whatever. How, how would they know it would get done? What was the investment with that? Like all of those things. And that chapter was really interesting about the the whole like cathedral building and just like many things that we have that took a long time to build. And that was a very interesting framework. I think, I think with the case of cathedrals, I think um, it's, 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 easy to look back and think okay well let's just go back to the way that they did things back then and and kind of build things that won't be kind of finished until the next generation picks it up um one of the the tricky things is that the the world is very different now it moves faster and um when there was an expectation um you know 600 700 years ago that the world that you would hand to your children would essentially be the same mm -hmm. and it was it's easy it's easier to imagine that mm. it, it was you know there'd be, there'd be no change it was flat but when you look at kind of like the graphs of progress over the past you know thousand years it kind of it really takes off around industrial revolution time it doesn't really kind of like there's not much change earlier on and so i think in a sense that just saying oh we should go back to cathedral thinking is is hard uh the, i mean al also there is a slight survivorship bias with, with cathedrals i think it's worth noting in that um, you know, so, so survivorship bias for those who you know don't know is, is that like you know you tend to we tend to look at the examples that stuck around and see only see those and, and judge that as the the example of of like you know great works for you know uh, of course many cathedrals collapsed many cathedrals were kind of uh, had shoddy workmanship you know that it, it, we don't see the ones that didn't last through the ages unfortunately um, so it's not I mean there's a, there was a prayer that was said in some cathedrals in the in the you know the uh uk and it, it went something like you know please lord may the roof not stifle us you know it was, it was knowing that the, the roof could collapse at any moment um but yeah so so the people in the past had did have a um a, 
a different view. Sometimes it was long, sometimes it was short, but I, I, that was what I was trying to get to the bottom of with, with that, that chapter, trying to kind of compare uh, present day uh, kind of long views with, with long views in the past. You mentioned the, the kind of the, uh, the end of the world and, and apocalypse is mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. So that, that's, an, that's another example where it's, it seems at first like there is a uh, inherent long view. I, if, if you think that the world's going to end soon and then you're going to live a timeless existence for the you know forever in heaven, which many people believe, you know, from many different religions. Um, mm-hmm. I, I kind of I learned this at Harvard. That there's a class that that is is taught at Harvard on the apocalypse, which is just a fantastically interesting kind of a uh, tour through all the different apocalyptic visions. Is this a by a guy, you know, Giovanni Pisano? Mm-hmm. Uh, he's an Italian, and he you know goes through kind of like the Christian apocalypse and then the the uh, the Muslim apocalypse, and the, it, it's it's fascinating. Mm-hmm. But w- what it what it's n- not necessarily is the same kind of long view as the present day, in that. If you, if you imagine people seeing the end of the world coming in in 100, 200 years time, potentially, you know, there was one famous, uh, I think it was a monk, Joachim of Fiore, who kind of imagined the end of the world was down the track, you know, 100, 200 years away. And then and then there would be a sense of kind of this timeless existence afterwards. Um, so, it, you know, it was a long view of sorts, but it wasn't necessarily uh, the trajectory of you know, humanity lasting for ages. It was. It was kind of. I'm going to go to heaven soon, and then it's going to be just be the same forever. So, yeah. I, long story short, I think it's. I think the the way that the long v- views manifested in the past wasn't the same as today, and we can't necessarily rewind the clock back to to past ages. But they, uh, there were there were different versions of time, different time views that did exist. Uh, certainly in, in the West and and, and elsewhere uh, you know, through the ages. Yeah, I, th- I think the point you mentioned before was is is right. Is that many people um, had a a um a lot, a lot didn't change. I mean, what was really different from seventeen hundred to seventeen fifty? What was different from seventeen fifty to eighteen hundred? Not a whole lot, right? Not a whole mm-hmm. lot. Mm-hmm. It's not really till you get to the twentieth century, and even then, um, you know, even in Western worlds, you know, things are changing quick quicker but still in much of the world it, it didn't change that much and so it hasn't really been i think until i guess you could say the 21st century really that things very you know globalization things like that rapidly change really fast compared to all of the other you know hundreds of years put together so i i have to imagine that that has um a pretty big big impact on on how people are going to think then uh long term Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, it explains our predicament today, right? As in, mm-hmm. if, if things are changing so fast, then it's it's harder to see what any kind of future might look like. And if the future is is dark, then then you, you you're going to focus more on the present. So, yeah, I, th- I think that's part part of the problem. I think the the, the pace of change. Yeah, and, and you talk about it also um, about I think maybe starting with the Enlightenment and then going into the 20th century, we we started to have this like turn of like. The future is always seemingly removed and impersonal. And it, then we started getting all the dystopian stuff. It's going to be, you know, scorched earth. It's going to be awful. It's going to be, you know, we and obviously, you know, with, you know, sci-fi and things like that, we've had plenty of <laughs> iterations with, you know, pick your, pick your film, pick your franchise of, you know, zombies or, you know, robots or whatever. And, 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 you know, or we have to leave the planet because of something. And there's always these, it's always negative, right? Which is, is interesting, right? I mean, maybe it will be, but there's never like a, a positive view of what is 200 years from now look like. And yeah, it's interesting how yeah. that turned in that way. I think, I think, um, I mean, speaking very, you know, in broad terms, like since, since the Enlightenment, there's been a kind of series of expansions and contractions. So th- there was there was a period um, during the 1700s uh, or so, you know, where um, the, the historian Lucian Holscher calls it the discovery of the future, where you know, all of a sudden many kind of European intellectuals like Kant and others started to write and think about the the far future. You know, the, the side, the Kant wrote about how there were, there were millions and mountains of centuries hence that could extend uh, beyond the present. Um, but then what happened was there was there was conflict. There was the French Revolution. Uh, it, there was oh, the optimism of that period was kind of was pushed 
back a little bit and we, we entered a period of when when there is crisis mm. when there's kind of war or conflict it's kind of natural and expected that people are more likely to focus on on the present you know it, it happened again arguably in the 20th century there was a period in the the, the 1910s 1920s when you have the likes of h hg wells the writer mm -hmm. you know looking ahead through his time travel stories you know millions of years but then that you you have the world wars and and you know, that, that sense of optimism uh, about the the far, far future kind of switches to pessimism and and, and the, the likes of the the nazis pick up mm -hmm. the the wellsian kind of technocentric view of the future and give it a much darker kind of turn and so you know i, I think that 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 set that the the size of the future kind of sometimes shrinks and then also kind of the 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 likelihood that we apply the lens of utopian or dystopian changes over time as well you know i, I think you know we, we you see it's interesting you see the certain films and uh that and and books that that repeat the themes of like the apocalypse and the end of the world mm -hmm. and and that and but then that runs you know through the past 100 years or so and then it, there are you've got war of the worlds and then then you've got uh kind of the the, the day after tomorrow you've got mm -hmm. it, it, this this idea that that the end is coming pretty soon uh tends to draw people to the to the short term I, you know i think i think that the the de that one of the dangers i think is especially in the times that we live in could be that the 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 bad news piles up so much that we we lose all sense of any possibility beyond the present and and doomism sets in you know i think do, doomism is like sadly a kind of a different form of short term thinking you know if if you think that the the end is coming soon and there is no future for humanity then why bother to kind of try and make a better future it leads mm -hmm. to a sense of ap apathy and helplessness unfortunately that that um i, I can understand you know I, I i look around at the world and see all the problems and, and the challenges that we face and and it's hard not to kind of conclude that this is this is a you know looking to be not a good decade century ahead you know but but i think if the future is still plural right as in that there is still possibilities ahead you know there's, there's the wrong paths but there's also the good paths and so that, that that's something that that research and writing the book led led me to you know to, thinking about the long view for, for a few years i you know i started with the problem of short-termism that, that was my journalistic instinct to kind of mm -hmm. look at the problem and then report that out but after spending so much time thinking about what it means to be long-minded you know i found other sources of kind of hope and agency and you know perspective that i think it fed into my own kind of personal life but also kind of gave me kind of the hope that it's possible for us as, a, as societies to take a long view too yeah yeah absolutely i, I agree i mean i think that it, it it almost feels not dependent but if you're taking a long-term view of things it's going to impact how you think about things in the short term i think that there's a kind of sort of like an accordion kind of you know motion of sorts of well you're going to be here in the long term thinking about these things so there's all of these building blocks to get there or you know some some aspect of that which is which is interesting i i wonder just kind of on the negative side of things i wonder if it's just lack of imagination if you're always thinking about things in a negative way this is going to be destroyed or this is going to be you know it's always very anthropocentric which is fine i mean that's our you know we're as humans but it's less so of of well, what is the earth going to do regardless right the earth is going to keep going you know even if we you know unfortunately burn it all and melt everything and all that it's gonna it's gonna adapt it's gonna you know we won't we'll be <laughs> we'll be gone unfortunately if we keep going the way we are but you know the earth will will find a way i think but um yeah, there was um you might know the book uh is by a oh, let me say ge it's not a geologist, um ecologist, excuse me. Yeah. Uh is it Rob Dunn? He wrote a um uh, natural history of the future, which was a, a great book. It was a great book. I talked to him um uh, maybe a year ago. Um he started thinking about what does the earth's future look like? 
how does the earth keep going? And he looks at it from a total ecological mindset. And, you know, we always think about, you know, uh, metropolis and flying cars and, you know, all these like technological advances, which is probably going to happen or some version of that. But what about what the earth's going to do? How's the earth going to keep evolving? You know, and it's super fascinating, super fascinating because it, it almost was a kind of positive component of like, how do we look at the, the earth in the future ecologically? And how do we see what's just kind of occurring as opposed to just what's the next extinction or what's the next destruction? And I think that that's, you know, important to do. It's important to have those because, because then you can, you can think about how you want to do things like, well, if you can imagine a positive, more positive world or a world that's, you know, a lot of potential for many things, you know, not just technology and, and, you know, or climate change, you know, those are two pieces of it. What are all the other hundreds of ways we can envision a future with humans or not without or whatever? What does that look like? How do we build for that? And that's important, no? Yeah, definitely. I, I think, um, yeah, I mean, to, to, to your point about um, that the earth will adapt. Yeah, that it's a bit it's a bit cheesy, but I, I think of like, you know, the Richard Attenborough character in uh, Jurassic Park, you know, life finds a way. It's And that's true. You know, that, like, there'll be adaptation and... I think even living alongside humans, like there will be mm -hmm. nature will learn to adapt alongside humans in, in different ways. Um, but yeah, the, to, to the point of that, there should be more um, views of the future than just the technological one. I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think it's something that uh, has, you know, views of the future tend, tend to be um, shaped by the kinds of people that produce future visions. And that, that tends to be, futurists who work and yeah. can get paid for within techno you know within technology and you know it, it's 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 often corporate or it's in governance or you know but the 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 future like belongs to everybody and there should be kind of an opportunity for for many other kind of sectors of society to to kind of to think about like the, the long term and so that, that's what i tried to do in the book you know like look, mm -hmm. look at like the 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 artistic kind of view like speaking to artists about what it takes to to like uh, you know think think long term for them and the the kind of the generational uh view where you kind of think about your family ties and the 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 the, the, the idea that the future is only kind of like a different version of technology just more advanced is sadly a bit yeah i, I mean I'm, th I'm thinking about it at a moment because I'm, I'm producing a series for the bbc uh called the tomorrow project which is mm. you know b b based on the anniversary of a, a a series of um, uh, future visions that that were kind of published 100 years ago. Exactly, it was it was called the Today and Tomorrow series. And over over the space of kind of five or six years, a uh, th these books came out, starting with kind of the future by J. B. S. Haldane, the geneticist, about the future of science. You know, he mm -hmm. he made all sorts of predictions about kind of like how there'll be. Uh, mechanical windmills dotting the, the countryside of the UK, which is you know pretty pretty accurate. There are quite a lot of windmills there. Mm -hmm. um, but then, but then the the series kind of moved away from science and technology and pacifists and and feminists and artists and musicians and you know there was there was uh, books about the future of swearing, the future of wine, the future of of, of women. It, it was it was not a kind of technological scientific mm -hmm. exercise. And, mm -hmm. and I, and I, yeah, I, I believe really strongly that. Uh, when the, we talk about the long view, it should be a democratic kind of approach. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think this would be the long views, plural, right? I think that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if 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 only a few people are deciding what the future trajectory of our societies look like, then that's the yes. problem. You know, it belongs to everybody. Yes, no, I, I totally agree. Uh, it's a, a little bit removed from this, but it kind of connects. Is that one of the things that gets me really more and more frustrated as I think about things, and it, it, it makes me more purposeful in how I engage with things online and public and private is, I think it's, it's, it's very simple to just be anti something or, or against something or negative about something. I think it's more, you're using more of your brain when and you're using more of your emotions and you're using more of your your who you are when you're trying to create in the world you know and when you're trying to do that every day as opposed to just you know shit posting or whatever it is you know or just being super negative um there's obviously room and space to critique things of course but i think that we have to 
say, oh, okay, well, there's room to be against things or have your opinions, but how, what are you contributing? How are you creating? How are you trying to find something? And, you know, I think in that way, uh, I mean, I'm going to sound a little bit old, but, you know, I think technology should be a tool, you know, to, to, to help you unlock that. And I think young people, you know, for, 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 you know, Gen Z's and, and for the, the, the alphas or the polars, whatever we're calling them after that, we need to really push for them to have a space where they can create and, and, and have people like, you know, previous generations did. I think that's, that's more, you know, effective than just, you know, what are, what are the, what are the things you're against or what's your cause? I think those things have a place, but how are we creating and, and, and different futures, right? That kind of pluralism, I think is, is super yeah. essential. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. No, I, I think, I mean, that kind of speaks to like the, the incentive structures and, and, uh, you know, I think the benefits that exist for doing things like going on Twitter and, you know, dragging down rather than pushing up, you know, I, I, or I, I think, I think there are, there are kind of, there are structures that exist within the modern media environment that, that nudge us towards focusing on the, the salient, the main character on social media that day, you know, and, and, and I think, I, I try. I try very hard to resist that, but it's it's difficult. You know, I think it's it's. Uh, <laughs> We've no, all been I, there. <laughs> that, that's. I mean, one one of the big challenges that I'm just trying to navigate at the moment is like, what what does a long media diet look like? Mm -hmm. I, I think you know, how how do you cultivate a a, a, me, a social media presence and a, and a kind of uh, things that you read that that allow you to see the the long term picture of of things, but. Because you, you can, I mean, you can do it. You can do it just with simple exercise. You can do. I, I did it a few years ago. I went back and, and looked at the BBC news homepage ten years beforehand for a talk I was doing, and looked at the stories on that page. And it, it, was, so, it was so striking to me that like hardly any of them mattered. Like ten years later, mm -hmm. there were there was a few, but I was looking at the time. You know, it was just after the financial crash of two thousand seven, two thousand eight, and mm -hmm. there was. Uh, there wasn't even that much mention of that. The biggest story of the, the, that decade, you know. So there was there was some, but it was. If you, so I, I've been thinking a lot lately about what, how, how do you avoid getting sucked into the outrage cycle of yeah. daily news? Because it, social media kind of is primed for that, but then also news organisations mm -hmm. mm -hmm. have recognised that outrage travels further on social media and and so produce more articles that are likely to get you angry and to you know so so i i don't think it's a, it's a systemic problem i don't think there's only one single individual to blame but i think you know if we if we want to have a longer media diet then i think you know we, we need to resist those those, those temptations and, and and i don't want to be clear i fail all the time <laughs> yeah no i full i fully agree with you i mean i i that's something i think about every day anytime i'm online and yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I've said this before. I, I'm very purposeful in, in how I, you know, have conversations on here on my podcast. I would want it to be. I always think about it before when I prepare and, and when I have them. Is could someone listen to this ten years later and still get a lot out of it? And I try my hardest to not date them, but also to make them um, really helpful, even even you know years later. I, I think if you're having a kind of um, you know, uh, shorthand that way. I think that's helpful. I mean, I can't, I mean, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've, I've going to post a tweet and then I, I just, I just, I just click backspace and I say, Nope, not going to send that one. <laughs> nope. I'm not, not going to be proud of that one. And you know, you know, two days. Yeah. So Nope, not going to do it. I think, um, I think a, t a technique that I've found is useful is, is to, send it to your wife or, or you know, <laughs> right, that's right, what I do. Right. You know, I say, here is what I would tweet. And she goes, okay, that, that's good. Don't, don't tweet that. <laughs> right, right. right. <laughs> yeah. yeah or, or put it in draft and then you'd be like, oh, well, I don't even remember what I was thinking about. Okay. I'm not going to yeah. send it yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you talk about some of the, the, the aspects of, of our, our, our economic system. And you talk about capitalism, uh, a chapter on that. Um, and so I guess just kind of big picture here. Um, many of our corporations do seem to have this uh, short-term appeal, right? As opposed to long-term in their thinking. Um, and that you mentioned in the book that capitalism is a, is a system, or excuse me, that's not capitalism as a system that's time blinkered, but the, the actors in those, in those capitalist uh, spaces. So I just wonder if you just want to 
So talk more about that, about, you know, mostly in a, in a capitalist society or, you know, maybe in other countries, there's a kind of socialism light kind of, you know, economy or whatever, but you know, free market society or others. Um, how, 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 how it is now, how it appears to be, and how would it look different if there was more of a long-term view of things sincerely? So I think, I think, um, when I talk about capitalism, I um, and the problems it it kind of faces with short term thinking, a lot a lot of it is not necessarily. Yeah, I'm not I'm not arguing for pulling the whole thing down and replacing it with something else. Mm -hmm. I think I think the the more the many of the issues that exist are um, inventions within the capitalist system that have only emerged in recent decades or over the past hundred years or so. I mean, to, to give you an example, like the 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 problem of quarterly thinking, which is is often cited as a as a kind of a short termist pressure where companies have to report to the market every quarter um you know with with, with their their projections. Um so it, it means that the a CEO of a company is a, has only got a kind of quarterly you know time horizon. Um and you know th there's all sorts of evidence that shows that when uh, le company leaders fall into that trap, they're more likely to uh, cut back on things like R and D and investments in capital, in, in infrastructure, and so on. Um, the thing is, it hasn't always been there. You know, it was it, it, it began only about 100 years ago. The, the New York Stock Exchange suggested that companies should start to kind of report to the market every quarter. Uh, it, it wasn't compulsory; it was you know advisory, as far as I don't know. It, it only really bedded in in like the 1970s as a kind of as a something that the companies had had to do um and ever since then there has been this this focus on the quarter and that 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 time horizon has has shortened for me, for many kind of company leaders they find it hard, you know if if you if you have to report to the market if your share price will go down if you don't kind of uh, please the the shareholders you know, over the next kind of three or four months then you're much more likely to to do that and and, and you see examples of uh, leaders who try to resist that. So, what, what, one of the the kind of famous examples it was, it was Paul Paul Polman. He was the CEO of Unilever, he, uh, the kind of the um, cosmetics brand. You know, he, he took over and almost straight away said, uh, "We're, we're going to do things differently. We're going to we're going to think long term." You know, he did things like acquire uh, Seventh Generation, which is kind of a, a cleaning brand inspired by. Uh, the Native American seventh generation thinking. He, you know, he said we're gonna, we're not going to kind of be as, as short term as as a company. Um, it took him a while to kind of to move past that. He was immediately punished by the markets. Uh, and it was not. It, it, he was able to do it because he, had, uh, as he said afterwards, I just got the job. Didn't think they were going to find me in the first week. <laughs> but it, it's it's very difficult for existing kind of companies to do that. Um, but then you know there are capitalist kind of um, targets. That have rippled down through many, many kind of levels. It's not just about the the, the CEO boss level. Um, there, there's the problem that the historian Jerry Muller calls metric fixation. This is this is kind of a, a where people become so focused on the, the targets and the metrics that have been set for them uh, that they are and and. This applies not just in capitalist organisations, but also many, many other organisations. You know, applies in the National Health Service where I am in the UK and various others. Um, but when when the, you're only focused on the metrics of the next month to a year, you're you're less likely to think long term. If, if your only goal is to hit those those targets, and if we don't design targets that are long term and have incentive structures or or deterrents for that, then it's less likely that people will 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 think with a long view. And it, there, there are, if you look around the world, there are other ways of organizing business that don't necessarily have such short, a short-term kind of target structure. You know, there are, uh, you, Japan uh, has its flaws. You know, it's, it's not a perfect business culture, but the, 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 the culture there is much more about cultivating for the long-term and, and, and passing forward uh, a, a, a company. There are, there are more kind of very old companies in Japan than any other single country, you know, by quite a way, and so that 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 kind of culture uh, within business is different. And I think the because there has been 
so much focus on the free market, you know, the, the kind of the, the neoliberal capitalism of the past uh, few decades, that that has uh, embedded a, a number of different practices, inventions of capitalism that don't necessarily represent capitalism in, 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 in all its forms, but, but do encourage a short-term view. Uh, so I guess, uh, let me kind of give a devil's advocate here <clears throat> on two fronts. So the first front would be, well, what's wrong with thinking by quarter? I mean, we got to be, we got to be, you know, rooted in, in, you know, three, every three, you know, three months, four months, and, and, you know, maybe throughout the year, fiscal year or things like that. What's wrong with, with doing that? I mean, if we're too far in advance, then we're not going to be able to do things here now. And we're going to, you know, you know, we're going to, we're going to be too lofty. And, and, and I think some people, you know, maybe there's examples where people have these big ideals or aspirations and, but they just don't know how to execute it, you know, in the short term. So you, you, you would need a balance, but so that's one piece, I guess. And then the other piece is, I mean, you, I would have to say that a place like big companies, Apple, Google, Amazon, et cetera, they have a five-year plan, 10-year plan for sure right i mean they're, they're, these aren't so in 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 that way would that meet up to your idea of long-term kind of planning that your kind of long-termism kind of thing or is that something different just because you plan five or ten years doesn't mean you have a long-termist view of sorts is there a difference there so maybe on those two fronts what, what are you yeah, saying? yeah yeah no fair enough um yeah, I mean, I mean, it, it depends on you and what your own horizon is. I mean, five to ten years is not very long for some people. Some people have a million year view. It's like, you know, sure, but, sure. I, but, but no, it's true. I mean, you, you're right. I mean, there are companies like uh, Google have, you know, had, had you know, their division. Was it called Google X or something? I can't remember. What, but what you know is about moonshots. But like when they were investing mm -hmm. things, things like balloons and all sorts of things. So I, I think if you're a big enough company, you can do that. Mm -hmm. That kind mm -hmm. of like blue sky thinking mm -hmm. and. You know, and, and Amazon is uh, has quite famously kind of Jeff, Jeff Bezos was involved in the the Long Now Foundation, which is this kind of like well known organization in San Francisco that's building a, a clock that will tick for ten thousand years, and they're building it on Jeff Bezos's land. You know, so it's it, he's he's not someone who uh, hasn't hasn't kind of tried to integrate long term principles within his his thinking. Um, so yeah, no, it's it's there. It's it's just that the 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 systemic incentive structures and deterrents are kind of work against that. That you know, it's it's hard. It's it's easy if you're a, a built a kind of a built a multi billion dollar company, but not so easy if you're at the the lower level of the small to medium enterprise. Yeah. And 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 that's you know going to be a, a huge a huge chunk of people. And the the the, fo the focus on the quarter and to your point about. What's so wrong with that? I mean, so, sometimes it's appropriate, right? I think I think there are times when, and this applies not just in business, but more generally, that we need to focus on the present when there's a crisis or a, a, a kind of a, a, a problem. I, I mean, I, I, I was certainly not arguing that like we should just always spend our time in the future. That leads to a kind of a detachment from the the present. It, we, we become just on a personal level, right? If you if you're not present minded, you, you you're not able to kind of enjoy life's pleasures or deal with the kind of the you know less less emergencies. You're not living so, life. You're you're just doing life. Yeah. Right. You're just always thinking about you know the future and you know isn't yeah. this the, the criticism right that people give millennials right? It's like or they're just always thinking about the next thing right? You're just always which has many great aspects to it, but sometimes yeah. you can just keep living your life in the future and not. You're, well, you're missing everything now, and then it's gone. So yeah. there's a, there's a balance yeah. there, of course. I think I think um, I mean j just just a, just a straightforward reason to to take the long view for a company though is I don't know. I give you an example. I mean, just Blockbuster, right? I I'm sure Blockbuster for a while was was like meeting its targets, and then then it drove off a cliff, right? So I, I think if you are not kind of like learning from the lessons of history and looking ahead to the potential change in the future. Then you, you you're doing pretty well for a while, but then everything stops, or you know, or, or yeah, you know, the metaphor of a tree or climbing to the moon. I, you 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 climb into the moon, it feels pretty good. But if you're climbing a tree, 
until you get to the top, you know. So I think that's <laughs> that, yeah. Right. that so yeah, I, I think I think like the one of the arguments of the book is that it's not necessarily that we need to to just just detach ourselves from the present. There, there are all sorts of reasons why we need to be present minded and to to attend to kind of the, the things that matter. Um, I, so I, I think it, I think it's both. Uh, you know, hard to do, but possible. I think. Yeah, I guess this will apply to all of the other pieces we'll mention here in a minute. But this idea of I mean, it's obviously going to be different in different domains, but it's, it's just sometimes it's it's really hard to know. We, we can't. We don't have this this gift of, you know, we, we're we're not all Nostradamus. We don't know. We can't. We can't do any fortune telling. And it's hard to know which ways the winds will go, especially with technology. So Blockbuster is a good example. I mean, how the hell would they know where we're at with streaming? But of course. You would have to kind of, I think you have to have some malleability or flexibility within your structure to say, okay, now we're going to, we're going to shift this now for where we're at here. But I think that's, I agree that that's so, I mean, that would be amazing, but that's, I think really, I think, and this is, again, this is, I'm, I'm reiterating your point for the book. This is the, (laughs) this is the problem when people don't have long-term kinds of thinking yeah, is, is, yeah. Is that you're not able to be flexible you shut down and you can't you can't keep evolving and expanding some companies do it i mean you can you can give some examples if you want but it's really hard to think what's our 200 year plan <laughs> it's hard, I, I think it's hard to think that way yeah it's true it's true i think um the the the, the companies so, so there's this kind of research on this i mean there's, there's papers about the organizations called deep time organizations you know it's com- organizations that have been around for a very long time and it look it, this paper um by these researchers lo- looks at the um the, the what what is it about these organizations that has, that has helped them stick around mm-hmm. and that that adaptability is 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 absolutely right and m- many of them have done things like served they're focused on human needs that and, and they've adapted to human needs over time not necessarily thought we make a product and that's it. So, I, I mean, or, or another example is, is a Japanese company I mentioned about this that, that mm-hmm. started started out making playing cards uh, uh, and gaming like a, a while ago, you know, more than hundred years ago in Japan, um, and then over the over the years has adapted to different forms of play. Uh, yeah, that company is Nintendo. Right, so they now make uh, Zelda and and you know the Nintendo Switch, but they started out in playing cards, and so the, the technology has changed. But they've they've been aware that human beings like to play, and probably will always will like to play, and that that that's that's serving ba- basic human needs. I think is the one of the keys to longevity. And yeah, I mean, I have my my copy of the next Zelda game pre-ordered. So I mean, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. Me it's, too. One, it's one of the best games. I mean, yes, of course, of course, but. I agree. There's a, there's a, there's a, there is a more long-term view there. I wonder if some of that is, I don't want to, this feels like a throwaway. I don't, I don't know why it feels that way, but I wonder if some of that's somewhat cultural, right? Like there are certain, certain countries or certain cultures that have a long history, just, just in general, their history is long. Like you think about Japan, and China, or, um, you know, Egypt or Iran, or um, some of these countries that have just, thousands of years of history and there's a kind of mm, there's something instantiated within that maybe i wonder if in some ways um other places you know like the united states it's just hard to think that way because when the united states has only been a country for less than 250 years so i wonder mm-hmm. if there's any kind of cultural loading there as well but maybe yeah. not but yeah yeah maybe i think that's interesting yeah. there's a, there's a um and an effect that speaks to this, it was coined by uh, Nicholas Nassim Taleb, uh, called the Lindy effect, and it it was based on a, a a rule that existed in the com in the comedy club New York scene of the nineteen sixties. Um, but basically, it states that the things that have been around for a long time are more likely to endure into the future. So, to, to make that tangible. St. Paul's Cathedral in London is probably more likely to exist in 500 years' time than the latest kind of office building that's just been thrown up. Um, 
Taleb kind of based it on this law. Uh, com- comedians that, like in the 1960s had, had you know, they would go for drinks afterward, the comedy clubs, and they developed this rule that if you had a career on television that was short and bright, then you, you appeared on TV all the time. It was more likely to plummet very fast afterwards, and it was better to kind of to have uh, infrequent. Uh, non-regular appearances and then you would have a longer career as a result you know so that that was that's the lindy effect and i, and I think it, you know it applies to an extent and it's, it's probably easier in japan to see that you know these things have always worked for a very long time and so therefore we can make a good bet that for example people are likely to want to play in the future you know the, the, there are companies that have been around making temples Congo Gumi is an example of a, a you know hundred years old, and it will probably be able to adapt into the future because there's likely always to be faith of some kind. You know, I, I think that those those kind of like long term patterns, I think maybe are easier to see in some countries. I don't know. I, I mean, I've only got my own spe- perspective. I mean, mm-hmm. London, UK, where I live, does have a long history, but. Yeah. You guys are a little bit older. You're a little bit older than us. So. <laughs> yeah, but look, look at look at the recent things that have been happening in the news in in the UK. I mean, it doesn't look like we have a long term vision, uh, at least no. at the moment. So, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Ask me again in a few years. Yeah, <laughs> that's very true. Um, so yeah, so so let's 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 uh, let's talk a little bit about the politics. I'll, I'll try and and stay focused. I, I sometimes this is my my hobby horse sometimes, but, um, I mean, yes short-termism in our politics without a doubt in many places around the world you mentioned it you know the uk obviously the united states um i think in much of many western countries but even in i mean i follow some of the elections and stuff in latin america too um i think that's also the case um there, there's a there's a lot of just short-term thinking and I'll just use the United States because that's, you know, that's that's where I'm from. That's where I live. Um, If you take something like Social Security that, you know, Roosevelt and his administration, you know, put forward and got it across the finish line, et cetera. I mean, that was a, a, a solution for a problem in the 30s after the the crash and the depression and all that stuff. I don't think there was any. um so not to my knowledge of my reading of history, I could be wrong here, but any idea that that would be around almost a hundred years later, I don't, at least not in the same way. I mean, there should be, you know, uh, more legislation should be updated. And I wonder how they would have done things differently if they're like, you know what, we're still going to be using this system in a, almost a hundred years from now, you know, in, in 2033, are we still going to be using Social Security? Well, yeah, probably. Well, oh man. Well, let's let's we gotta we have to go back to the drawing board on some of these things. We gotta make sure. And how do we, you know, interest rates or inflation or other you know recessions or crashes or things? That's bound to happen with economics. How do we kind of withstand some of those things? I, I, I I'm positive that it would be, you know, reformulated. And. In our politics, we just don't we don't think about it that way. I mean, again, same thing as you know, the American, uh, or excuse me, the Affordable Care Act in 2010 was passed. Such a big deal to get it across the finish line. We've been talking about that in the United States, and still wasn't you know what a lot of people wanted, you know, for over 100 years. And getting that passed was a big deal. But what's the likelihood we're going to have another <laughs> in the United States Congress, uh, another big healthcare reform package passed like that in the next hundred years. Realistically, I would say probably pretty slim because it took so long just to get there. And it had over 60 attempts in the Supreme Court to get it repealed. I mean, that's just, it's insane. You know, it's just like, so why do you think this is for, why do you think this is that we're so short term in our politics? And what does it look like when uh, three questions. Okay, so why is our why is our politics so short term now? What would it look like if we did plan things a hundred or two hundred years in advance? And could we do that? Are things changing politically too fast to 
um, to really plan for that. So just as an example, in the United States, in 1980, we United States elected, you know, at the time, the oldest president, Ronald Reagan, and the Soviet Union was the big, bad, evil empire, the whole thing, X, Y, Z, et cetera, et cetera. Less than 40 years later, you had a president in Donald Trump who's, you know, playing footsie with, you know, a former KGB member. And totally, there's some a healthy amount of people that have a neutral to semi-positive view of Russia and, and many of the things that are espoused there. And that changed. I mean, if you were to ask Republicans or if you were to ask anybody that's a Reaganite in 1988, in 1998, maybe in 2008, you wouldn't have said that this party would have had a change that quick within a generation. So how could you plan? A hundred or two hundred years politically, for many of these kinds of ripples here. So I, I gave you a lot there. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Because there's a lot to get into there. Um, I, feel, I mean, the first thing I should say is that like, the, I, I, I can't solve U.S. politics. That's that's a big one. <laughs> like, the, yeah, no, I know. I, <laughs> no, I know nobody can. Um, yeah. But you can use an example from England if you want, or or anywhere else. But what? Yeah, yeah, how do these yeah. kind of three ideas of how we how how um, we use a long term view. I mean, I, mean, I, th- I guess. I mean, just first of all, one one thing that kind of occurred to me as you as you were talking was that that but political change might not necessarily always mean getting legislation through. Like you know, there's also kind of citizen led change too. You know, and, and and there has been many, I would argue, positive changes politically over the past few decades in terms of you know equal rights, human rights, and and, and so on. So I think I think. We shouldn't be too pessimistic. That said, there are kind of um, there's big there's there are big problems that have made it more likely that politicians will focus on the short term view than they might have done in the past. I mean, because because if you if you look at it from the point of view of the the um, just the, the electoral cycle, it's it, it's the, the democracy has a kind of embedded within it a a system that means that the individual politicians are more likely to focus on. Uh, the things that will please the electorate uh, to ha- get them put back into power. You know, there's this, this is, there's, there's like famous quotes to that effect. Like, like John Claude Juncker, Juncker the uh, um, former you know president of the European Commission, you know, once famously said, uh, I think after the financial crash 2007 2008, you know, we meaning politicians, we we all know what to do. We just don't know how to get reelected after we've done it, yeah. and and I think that's, that's that it's it's not like the politicians that don't don't know that what they need to do, although some of them <laughs> I can't speak well. <laughs> um, so, but I think I mean the the environment in which uh, politics operates has has arguably changed. So you know the, 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 we live in a time of social media and instant reactions, where you know a, a, an inst- a gaff can lead the news uh it's everything moves much faster um you know the, the, we talked about incentives earlier on their the social media has rewarded a certain kind of politician who is able to say pop i mean the populism is is entwined with with social media and, and the wider media ecosystem that exists now so i i think um i mean one of the terms i talk about in books is is, is horizon creep mm-hmm. uh and and so p- people's kind of time horizons can can be lengthened, but they can be shortened too. And, and if you've got a media that is is continually focusing on on the present, so I, I think I think as a general general generality, there are, and I say this as a journalist myself, journalists have an even shorter view than than politicians. You know, I think that, you, that we're looking at the kind of the next days or the mm-hmm. next hour, hours kind of news. So. And, and when when me, media becomes uh, permeates culture, where you know where you can't ex- escape politics all the time, then it, it's much more likely to kind of make it that a politician will attend to the things that are in front of them. So, I, in in the book, I talk about uh, a spectrum from from what, uh, one end of the spectrum is is a, a fast fires, and at the other end, a slow burns. And so, if you, if you look at kind of the how how politicians had to deal with the the pandemic, for instance, um, there were a lot of fast fires 
in a very short time there was there was kind of I don't know what it was like in the US, but there were you know PPE kind of shortages. There was the issue of like masking and not masking. There were there was all sorts of kind of uh, you know political questions going on. You know, in in the UK there was uh, the question of, of whether a chap called Dominic Cummings had broken lockdown rules. You know that that every day there was a new crisis, and that would that. So that those are the fast fires. But then at the same time, the politicians had to be focused on the the longer term question of, for example. How are we going to get vaccines rolled out next year when they're ready? Uh, what what are the kind of the long term consequences of for health and for people with long COVID? Uh, all, all these kinds of questions were longer term, and in many ways, we the the, the media, the the kind of the, the public rewarded the politicians that acted uh, fast and you know who dealt with the issue in front of them. There was no there was no incentive to uh, apart, unless you were willing to wait a year. To, to focus on the, the kind of the, the slow burn problems, and I think that I suppose I suppose kind of raises a question for it, this. I mean, this links back to to what we were talking about earlier on about a media diet. That, that if if like everybody on the internet is focused on what's happening that day, then that's going to feed into our politics. It's a two it's, it's two way, and uh, that can be a, a, a positive force for good, right? Think about. You know, we talk about political change. Think about like how much the hashtag Me Too changed things. You know, or Black Lives Matter. That, that that was an example of where focusing on the present created political change in a, in a positive way. Um, but if if we're focused on what Elon Musk has said on Twitter that day, then it's less likely to kind of uh, you know create positive change. So I, I think to an, to an extent. I find myself like in a vision of, of, of def- defending the politician, which I don't particularly want to do. But I think the only way for long-term thinking to integrate into politics is for the the the, the public also to kind of demand it, right? If 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 we as as citizens focus on just the short marshmallow that we need, you, you know, in front of us, and are not willing to kind of delay gratification, if we punish politicians that. That do things like say, well, we need to invest in climate change over the next kind of fifty years. Then it's natural that politicians are less likely to to want to kind of to make those decisions. So I, I think some some level of citizen action is is necessary in order to create the environment. And and, and I'm so I'm definitely not saying that politicians are blameless on that front, but it's a systemic problem. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. I think there's a it's a two way street, if you will. Right. And so yeah. both are feeding off of each other. So just a, a few other uh, bits here. You mentioned the work of uh, Thomas Suddendorf, um, who wrote a book recently called The Invention of Tomorrow. Uh, Tim and a few other folks, uh, one of them, Adam Bully, who was on the podcast not that long ago. Um, she was super lovely, super brilliant. They they wrote a great book, very much uh, evolutionary uh, lens, and you mentioned some of the work uh, in your book, and and so I'm I'm curious about they're they're more I think my understanding is interested in the idea or the evolutionary idea of foresight. How did humans evolve this element of foresight, which is um, different from perspective memory, um, the ability to remember things to do in the future, but um, but there's some I think overlap there cognitively. Um, so I guess what's your idea on their work on foresight and how does this tie in with your um, you know, position on long-termism and, and where do you see it's it overlaps and where is maybe it's a little bit different? Sure. Um, well, f- first of all, I should give a plug for the previous episode with Adam Bully because that, that was a, a really good conversation and it sets up a, <laughs> you know, a lot of this, yeah. this conversation. It's uh, the yeah, sequel it to that one. Great. It was a great conversation. Yeah. yeah, yeah Adam, yeah. Adam's great. Adam's great. Yeah. So, so, um, uh, but Bully Suddenly uh, talk about kind of mental time travel. This the the ability to transport the mind across out of the present into the past and into the future. Um, it's it's a remarkable ability that we can do this. You know, it's it's something that we take for granted. Um, that, that we can uh, remember what we had for dinner yesterday and plan for what we're going to have for dinner tonight. You know, but but much further. You know, we we, we can project the mind. Uh, pretty far you know some people can think across kind of 10 15 years some people think across 100 years um but that 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 skill is not something that 
that came easily, nor, nor is it kind of a, a widespread in the animal kingdom. But Suddendorf and his, co his colleagues have looked at various different um, examples of, of other creatures who may or may not have had this this ability to mentally time travel. Uh, so you can look at like scrub jays, a type of bird. They they do things like hide seeds or uh, that they come back to later on, or or primates will kind of carry a tool between two, two different parts of a, uh, an experiment in order to kind of unlock a, a, a tree. Um, or, or, you know, there's a famous example of Santino, the, the, the chimp, who was causing a bit of a problem in a, a zoo in Sweden a few years ago. So he, he, would, do, he would do this curious thing where, where, where you know, Santino would wake up in the morning and he would go get rocks and go and, and hide them in various different parts of his enclosure in this, this Swedish zoo. And the zookeepers watching him were kind of a bit puzzled as to why he was doing this, uh, you know, building these little piles of rocks and then hiding them. But it became clear when the the all the zoo visitors came in and you know walked up to the enclosure uh, and, and started looking at Santino, he he would amble over to the rocks and just start chucking them into the crowd. So that that was an example of apparent forward planning in a in a, a primate that wasn't a human. So uh, th those examples are kind of tantalizing. Uh, hints that it's possible for other creatures to to think about the past and the, the future. However, the idea that animals can think about the long term future that's there's there's hardly any evidence for that. You know, planning rocks rock throwing that afternoon is very different to imagining what it will be when you will be an old, old you know an old man or an old woman. Um, and you know, and Sundorf and Bully uh, and, and Redshaw in their book, you know, write about it being Promethean. I mean, it, it, it was, it's, a, it's an amazing skill to have, but it's also has, has its downsides. And it, one, one of the downsides is that you can imagine your own death, which is not a nice thing to think about, right? So I think that that's something that's like kind of unique to human beings that we can imagine being kind of 80 years old and, and passing off this, uh, passing, you know, to somewhere else. So uh, the reason the reason I was interested in in this research is is that the the basic skill of mental time travel is is obviously key to taking a longer view, and so that, that that's kind of in in part two of the book that that's where I start. You know, with the the view that it's it's possible to to kind of extend the mind into other other uh, times. So why is it that we don't always do it? And so that, that was, that's the kind of the base through, through which to look at kind of our psychology. Yeah, I think I think I think that that's right. Is is and I think that's the claim that they make, and and I think that you're making more uh, tangibly is what why aren't we extending further? <clears throat> which I think, um, yeah, I think Adam asked me this in the conversation. Uh, and I'll give my same response because I haven't changed. <laughs> which is, he said he, he asked me. He said. When you think about your life, how far in advance can you think? I said, ah, 10 years, maybe 20. I can't, I can't, uh, I'm in my late 30s uh, or just, and I, I can't think about what I'll look like in my late 50s. I'm a fairly consistent person, um, but I can't, I, I can't, I don't know. I don't, I mean, I kind of sort of got an idea of what I'll be doing. You know, I, I went to school for a long time, so hopefully I'm still <laughs> doing my career. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, but I, I just, where am I going to live? It, probably likely where I've always lived, because that's where I've always lived. You know, I just, but in terms of like my day in and day out, what I'm going to do in my life, it, after like even five years, to be honest, it's so hard for me. So I get this kind of existential anxiety when I think about like the year 2100. Or like, what's the year twenty five hundred look like? I have no. I, I have what when I when I I think he asked me. He said, "What do you, what do you picture? What do you visualize?" I was like, "It's blank. I don't think of anything. It's mm. just there's just nothing there. It's just fog. Yeah. It's yeah, just yeah. nothing. There's just it's like it's like that. Um, it's like that scene in the is it the second or third Matrix? Maybe it's both. Where where Neo's in that room and it's just all white and there's nothing in there. And like that's just kind of how it is for me. There's just like nothing." There's no horizon. I can't, yeah. my brain can't go that far in the future. Is it, do you think that that's most people? Like they can't go, like I can't, I don't know what the 22nd century looks like. Even saying that out loud sounds super weird. 
but you're right, as you were talking about in the beginning part of your book, that you know, um, your your daughter and 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 my daughter will be old, but probably in the 22nd century. And you know, it's I mean, who knows what it's going to be like. So I mean, I don't know. How do we? Why is it hard for us to see far so far in time? A hundred years, two hundred years, three hundred years. Why so? So there's a few ways to answer that question. So um, w- w- one relates to the the way that um, we, we build a sense of the future through through kind of memories. So the, the 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 future is essentially a tapestry of of kind of memories that we've built, and, it, and we kind of know this because there've been kind of fascinating uh, individuals who th- th- there's a there's a a, a chat um, that I write about in the book called Kent, Kent Cochran who had a motorcycle accident. Um, in his thirties, I think, and um, it left him with the after he recovered, recovered from the accident, left him with amnesia. And uh, at first, you know, it seemed like he was just kind of he was a like a lot of amnesia patients. However, when psychologists started quizzing him, they realised he didn't have any conception of the future at all. So, it, it, but they asked they asked him lots of questions like, "What what are you going to be doing tomorrow?" And he would be be blank he would have he was very congenial and a very pleasant man you can actually watch the interviews with him on youtube they're they're fascinating you know he's got a massive smile on his face he seems quite content and happy but um he he had no episodic memory no ability to kind of to think think ahead he he had he had um uh semantic memory so if you asked him how to change a tire or you know what a clock was he could tell you um so but he, he, he couldn't remember uh, what he did yesterday, nor could he think about the future. And so, so that, that I guess, is in a, a similar kind of thing, but for us uh, at 15, 20 years, that there's, there's a study that does actually speak to this, like Bruce Tun, who is, a, I think, an Australian uh, futures researcher, just, you know, he surveyed lots of people and said, how far in the future can you imagine? And the, av- the average was about 15 years. After that, the, av- the, go- the future goes dark. Mm-hmm. Um, that said, there, w- there was, there were one or two people who answered a million years, but, but he kind of he excluded them from the data because yeah. if he, if he, if it included a million years into the average, then it would have completely kind of changed it. Uh, uh, yeah. still, still, I think it's quite interesting that someone did say that and he just chopped it out. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think I think uh, so. That's that's part of the problem that we stitch the future together from you know with as a tapestry of the past. Um, there is also a distancing effect. So this. In in psychology, it's known as construal level theory, and it's essentially like psychological distancing, or you might call it temp- temporal distancing. Um, our, our sense of time is entwined with distance. You know, when we when we talk about the future, I think it's curious that we use the words far or distant. Mm-hmm. And th- this, so this this theory proposes that um, when we think of the year twenty one hundred, it's not twenty one hundred here now you know in, in in london it's it's far away somewhere over the horizon the horizon you know mm-hmm. distant a distant land and and so that makes it harder to imagine that that's a, a, so i i try and kind of avoid using the word far as much as possible when i'm talking about the future i prefer other words like deep but it, english kind of is lacking for that yeah it would be nice to have a way of talking about yeah. time outside the present that wasn't kind of equating it with, with being far away or distant so that there are that there are these these kind of the the way that the 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 mental architecture of time in our brains does make it difficult to, to project ahead to the future mm-hmm. I, I don't know I, I i agree with you in the sense that i don't i can't imagine myself as a as an old person but i do know that the there will be some things that will be the same you know i i, I think you you can't kind of have a, have a rich kind of movie like version of your of your life but you can be pretty confident that mm-hmm. you'll have many of the same interests and and kind of relationships in your life you know or i think or even though even though that can change right so i think that you, you can't bet on anything of, of course but i think if you take the view that you know, to go back to what we were saying earlier on about the, the Lindy effect, things that have always been there for a long time stand mm-hmm. a pretty good chance of kind of continuing to the future. But those those kinds of things. Like, I mean, just to give you, to give you one, one story about the book itself, one of the reasons I wrote this book or decided to focus on this topic was because my, my wife asked me 
you know, I was I said to her, like, what I'm, I'm thinking about writing a book. What what should I focus on? There's all sorts of things I'm interested in. And she said, uh, she asked me, she said, what's always been there? And and I was able to trace back, like back through like kind of my my interests across the past 10, 20 years of my life. You know, I I'd been interested in geology as a as a young man and at New Scientist magazine, I did a special about the deep future. So I knew I knew that a pretty good bet in five years' time when the book is coming out, which is now in 2023, <laughs> I'd, st- I'd still be into this topic. It isn't just a passing kind of like that. And so, right. so th- th- those kinds of things you can start to kind of project ahead, I think, you know, but, uh, you know, who, do- mm-hmm. <laughs> who knows what we'll both look like when we're kind of 70 years old. I just, the main thing is I just want to get there, you know, so <laughs> that, that's, that, yeah. that's, my, that's my plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I, I agree. I mean, um, yeah, I also have a a fascination with um, like the geological time scale, all the different epochs and periods of the Earth. I, I find it, I don't know. I kind of got into it a couple of years ago, and I just I find it so fascinating. All like the Jurassic and the Triassic, and the um, you know the the Holocene, and the, you know, all of these different periods of the Earth. What makes them? Uh, periods distinct from others and you're talking about time in millions of years um it's fun looking at the debates people have about the anthropocene and how they get very angry about calling it that or not calling it that or when is this it's super and then to think about you know we're still going to be in the same period probably for the next hundreds and thousands of years so just think about time that way is super interesting and when you're talking about Kind of going into, you know, when you go to like deep in time, uh, you know, like pre-Cambrian, you know, so long ago, millions of years ago, um, you know, but what does it look like in the other way? And it's so interesting to see, you know, so much of the earth is the same, but it's not. Um, it's it's inter- I remember having a conversation with uh, Andrew Knoll, who's a, you know, a pretty, pretty big geologist, and he he we talked about these different timescales of the earth and different periods and how we understand certain things. And it's really fascinating to know how, how we can know these things um, from it's all in the rocks, right. Or a lot of it's in the rocks. Um, But you know, what does that look like for the future and how, again, just trying to think about, you know, if it's happened that way in the past, you know, we, we know that, you know, our sun has, you know, however many billions of years left to burn or whatever it is, you know, so, you know, the earth is going to keep spinning as, as, ostensibly. So what does that look like? And it's hard to kind of, you know, kind of, kind of get there in terms about like who we are. I mean, I agree with you. I mean, I think intuitively that makes sense. Um, we have this type of self-referential memory that we're able to have these memories of ourselves that stay constant. Um, and there are many aspects I think of ourselves that do stay constant. Um, I have a, uh, at the moment, an ongoing debate with with a social psychologist Brian Lowry about he he believes that ourself is always changing and evolving and continuing uh, based on the social relationships we have, um, mm-hmm. which is which is a very interesting uh, uh, idea. I love talking to him about that stuff, mm-hmm. and um, it's just interesting though when we think about who we're going to be in fifty years if we're alive, you know, or what that looks like and how how much will be the same and how much we won't be things of that nature. I want to, I want to ask you about, you mentioned it, I think somewhere in the book, I don't remember where this idea about um, ritual and how that's really important for long-termism, which makes me think about the ideas that were in um, some of the things that were built in the time past or how we have these things, uh, certain cultures or certain uh, groups of people will have these things that they do uh, through time to keep them connected and that there's, you did it this way and you keep doing it this way for hundreds of years sometimes. How much do you think those kind of habits or rituals are important for pushing uh, a value or an idea or other things through the future uh, as, a, as a kind of long-term way of thinking about things? Sure, sure, yeah. Um, I mean. 
what what you said about deep time is is, is interesting. And like, so you want to come back to that in a minute? Let's 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 talk because I I am also really fascinated by geology and deep time. But but ritual that question is something that I think is I, I you know I thought about a lot. Um, it, it, it kind of started with the question like what how do you make something last? Yeah. Um, again, it was that question of longevity. Mm-hmm. Um, what makes something like last through the ages? Um, and there there are different. Say say if you want to make um an idea like last for a very long time um the there are different ways you can do it you can i mean you can do something like you can build a statue or encode a message or uh you know hope hope that some that something like that that you create will be uh preserved and would last through the generations so i call, I call this the the, the patek philippe strategy um so patek philippe the watchmaker you know, once had a, 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 a an advert. I think well, I don't know if it's still running. Um, which was the, the the essence of the advert was was like you know you you only you never own a Patek Philippe watch. Uh, and you you just pass it on for the next. You just keep it for the next generation. Um, I'm not sponsored by Patek Philippe. Just <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> like, but you know, so, and, and that that's an that's the approach of like build build the presidential library uh, or or kind of create create an heirloom of sorts that that you know your children would keep and then they they pass to their children. Um, the, the the downside of doing that obviously is, is that the heirloom that you create has to be something that your children want to keep going and that that and it also kind of. Has, Faces the problems of decay, and you know, uh, if you if if something uh, will uh, decay over time, then it's less likely to last. Um, another strategy, if you want to kind of keep an idea going, is to create a system of ideas and traditions and rituals that a community believe in. And and the, the, I saw this; it, it, you can see this in various different places. I mean, religions have got all sorts of rituals that carry forward their ideas through the generations. Um, the examples I look at uh, in the book are, are kind of the the Zoro, Zoroastrian the thousand year flame and the, the Japanese kind of Shinto temple rebuilding in Isa. Um, so the, the, the Zoro both, both are completely transient uh, things that have lasted for thousands of years, but have done so through the power of ritual. So the, you know the, the first is the, the Zoroastrian flame is that you know it, it's these cathedral fires that burn. In, in India and Iran, they're extremely rare, but they've never gone out. They, they, they've been priests who've tended this flame for, for centuries, just kept it going. And the the reason is, is that there are kind of all sorts of rituals and, and kind of practices around uh, the, the the tending of the flame that, that keep it going, despite the fact that the item itself is burns, is completely transient. Same with same with Inisa in Japan. There's a there's a shrine. That is rebuilt every twenty years. You know, they they, they build them side by side, like with uh, with wood taken from a, a forest in the mountains. Uh, uh, they're, they're almost identical, and so for the brief period, there's two identical shrines shrine by side by side, and then one of them gets dismantled, and all the things get moved from one to the other. Uh, again, transient materials, wood and thatch. Uh, the, the item in question is not designed to last through the ages, but the the kind of the the Sengu kind of rituals that the the Shinto um, priests and, and members practice keep it going, and so I think and I think when you start to look at that lens of, of, of ritual and tradition, you start to think of all the other different things that that uh, apply in in day to day life, like support for sports teams. It often is, is infused oh, yeah. with ritual. You know the 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 kind of the the holidays traditions that we we all observe. You know the, the things the pointing of the tree. In the center of the room, uh, in at Christmas time, for example, uh, you know, for, for a lot of people around the world, it's something that is is just an idea that is carried forward through the ages, and people will do it every year. Mm. But the, but the tree itself, you know, it doesn't doesn't last. And I think that that question of, of like, well, how do you make things last? Often the answer is that ideas are carried on on rituals and traditions. Yeah, there was a. Uh... There was a book that came out a year or two ago. I can't remember when it came out by um, the anthropologist. He's at uh, Connecticut, I think, University of Connecticut, Demetrius uh, Galatas. He wrote this book called Ritual. And it was super fascinating. Um, really, really good book. And he talks about this idea of 
why humans, um, uh, mostly, I mean, why they do all these rituals and why it makes life, you know, really worth living in some ways and why we, why we do that. Why is some things that just feel really silly or innocuous or, or completely unnecessary, you know, objectively. Uh, but then you see how it's, it, it, it really fosters our sense of, uh, cultural evolution, if you will. And uh, I think there is a lot of value for that. And to, to your point is this idea of uh, this kind of long-term view of how, how do we, how do we, you know, able to keep things going, you know, keep certain ideas or certain things there. Um, so I guess the, 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 I have two, two final questions here, two, three questions, sorry, is, um, so we've been talking about long-termism overall. Um, you know, of course, I mean, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about climate change. Uh, um, obviously that's a, it's a big, big topic. Everybody's talking about it uh, and has, have been for many years. You know, what, where does your idea of long-termism, I guess, for the planet or what humans can or can't do in terms of the climate. But I mean, what are your, I guess, just your general ideas about, you know, many of this aspects of climate change with the long-term view you know, do, do, do people really have that view or is it just a lot of, you know, uh, you know, politicking, things like that. There's a lot of things wrapped up in it now, but what, what do you think about how we should be considering how we care for the planet and, you know, over the next hundreds of years? Um, so, so I think cl cl climate change is an example of a, an idea that's taken quite a long time to enter the public consciousness. And I think if you go back over the past hundred years, there have been people and individuals who were in a minority saying this matters and in even more, even more of a minority, right? So you have people like Guy Callender, a kind of engineer in the 1930s, saying that it may be the case that all this burning of coal is going to be bad for the atmosphere. Um, so, I, so I think um, the the the, the I mean, I, that, that that way that the generations, different generations bring a different attitude to it, uh, but it takes a long time, is is something that I think does at least give me some hope. I, I, I guess the, the news today uh, that, you know, we need, to, we need to act fast and act urgently now suggests that this generation right now needs to, to kind of move move fast. But I, I think uh, I I see many trajectories ahead and the the... the it, I don't think we should give up hope yet. You know, I think I think there is there's I, I don't know. It's, it's a good, climate change is a, is a mixture of to go back to the you know the the different pace of different problems. There there are many ways that climate change is emerging into emergencies all around the world with with floods and wildfires and changes in sea level that are bring making it salient and making it that we that we act now. So I th I think that the, the the public will is there now so it, the, the the question now is is more like how fast do we act rather i i think most kind of reasonable sane people are not saying not debating about whether climate change exists or not you know most sane yeah. reasonable politicians yeah. accept it it's just how how fast are we willing to do it and so it's so, you know i i think in, in i the question of like how much do we discount the future that you know how much value do we place on future generations like uh in terms of you know the the, the economic value of of their lives is something that politics wrestles with and then there are debates within climate change about this so, you know there are yeah. there's some economists who think we should, the the discount rate it needs to be reduced and that there are others that say like you know we, future generations will be able to pay for this and so we 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 don't need to act as fa as fast as that so the, the 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 pace at which we respond to it it's, it seems to be the yeah. question that we're dealing with now so yeah. yeah i would agree i think my biggest thing is the pace on it and just global cooperation i mean i i've i've said this more recently is that the united states or maybe many western countries could do everything the most aggressive things possible everything you know, do full extreme cap and trade the whole thing the whole thing but there's massively big countries like China and India that if they don't do their part as well, it doesn't 
I'm not saying it doesn't matter what other countries do, but they need to, they're a big contributor to emissions and many other things. And so it's hard to get 8 billion human apes all on the same page to yeah. <laughs> act aggressively yeah. and fast. It's it's a very big challenge. And it's frustrating because it's not something that we're unaware of or something that happens kind of like the pandemic or something. Um, it's something that we've been knowing for a while. We need to, I think, act urgently. But I mean, um, you know, it's it's hard to be for everyone to act proactively and for everyone to do something aggressively as much as they should. You know, that's obviously not to say that many countries um, haven't done things, even the ones I, I named. But um, you know, it's, I think that's I think that's what's really difficult. Um, you end the book uh, talking about that the long view is a few things. You talk about it being restorative, wayfinder present and more meaningful, accessible to everyone, democratic, politically unifying, having a healthy media diet, a clear picture of progress, an engine for hope. So there's a lot of these very pragmatic kinds of things. Uh, if you want to touch on any of them kind of generally or or what are the, I guess, the the, the practical ways that people can have a more long-term, long, long view of things uh, for themselves and for the society that they they live in? I think, I think, the the end of the book is is you know as as it should be is is where where I ended up after spending five years thinking about this you know as I said at the top of this conversation I I started with the problem that you know that the, the world is uh, in trouble in so many different ways you know I I, I looked at the issues of climate change antibiotic resistance uh, you know the problem of artificial intelligence the you know, all, all the kind of like risks of catastrophe that are coming down the line and all, and all the kind of the graphs that are going the wrong way. Um, however, over, you know, over the course of researching and writing this book, I uh, was able to kind of stand back from that and, 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 and discover kind of the benefits of, of taking the long view. You know, I, I found that, that when you start to start, uh, look at the kind of the treachery of lots of different measures, there are many things that are getting worse, but there are many things that are getting better. You know, there are, there are, the, the you know there's a website called our world in, in data which kind of mm -hmm. has, has this kind of ethos of, of, of like looking at like the long-term trends and things and you know i think things like extreme global poverty uh, is, yeah. is is getting is getting better you know i think um child mortality uh, you look take the long view of of things like free schooling you know for, for children like that that's something that we take for granted like now but like it's it's not it wasn't the case like it just is you know, a few hundred years ago um, and so, and so that you know, th those those are kind of like the uh, there are there are sources for the kind of the hope there, that 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 whilst the the wrong direction is 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 happening in many different areas, that the long view can reveal the the, the sources for hope, energy, uh, perspective. You know, I I think it's it's clear that that we can't just sit back and let the world carry on. On the on the current trajectory on so many different measures, but uh, I, I take a source of of hope from the fact that past generations faced problems too. You know, they faced world mm -hmm. wars. That you know, when, when you kind of like step into the shoes of your grandparents and think about the, some of the things that they faced and the great grandparents, you know, different points in history when like it seemed that that everything was falling apart. It you know and, and some people did the right thing and and stepped up and and changed the the world's trajectory and i think that that kind of that long view gives me a source for hope you know i, I think the the when i look at like you know my daughter's generation i see possibility you know things are not defined yet i think that there are many different futures ahead of us that are it's not singular the future is not singular we often talk about the future but it's futures obviously it's plural and there are many paths that we could take that that's that was the conclusion i came to at the end of the book that that with the long view come comes that that sense of energy or autonomy and perspective yeah yeah no i i i firmly agree with with everything you're saying there and i think it's it's super important to to really see the world in in, in that kind of way uh the book is called the long view uh why we need to transform how the world sees time uh, where can people find the book and where can people find yourself? So um, if you, I, I have a newsletter called the long viewer field guide, uh, which is on Substack. So that, that kind of has regular updates about the book uh, on Twitter and uh, at Riffish. Uh, and uh, to get, to get hold of the book, 
it's lots of different ways, you know, it's, it's all good stores, right? But like, um, the, the, my, my publisher page has has got many different options depending on which, uh, you know, retail, retailer you like. So it's, uh, it's available in the UK, Australia and various other territories at the moment, but uh, it will be uh, elsewhere soon. Yeah. Well, uh, Richard, this was a lot of fun. I was really looking forward to the conversation. I'm, I'm not disappointed. I, I don't think the listeners will be as well. You're, you're generous with your time and, and for writing such an important and timely book. So I, I can't say enough thanks for, for you coming on and sharing all of your, your ideas. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for the in-depth conversation. And you know, also thank you for kind of lifting up authors, right? You do it all the time on this podcast and on Twitter. It's it's great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just just I, I, I love I love uh, uh, reading and knowledge and, and really promoting people that are creating and putting something out there and many folks like yourself and I think we we need, you know, to just do more of that uh, than, than anything else. So uh, again, big, big, big thanks. <laughs>